I want to introduce uh, Professor uh, Justin Orion in just a few sentences because he asked me to do it shortly. Um, Professor uh, Justin Orion is a behavioral ecologist with a special interest in the understanding and mitigating conservation conflicts in Southern Africa. He heads the um, Institute of, uh, for Communities and Wildlife in Africa, IC Wild. I, I encourage you to uh, look at the uh, internet site of uh, this organization uh, in the internet. Uh, it's stated in the University of Cape Town. Um, the PhD of Professor uh, Orion was on uh, naked uh, more rats, a uh, uh, very uninteresting uh, uh, mammal. And, and the other un an interesting mammal uh, which he studied was a meerkat, uh, I think two of the most interesting mammals in the world. And uh, I, I imagine where he got the idea of sociality uh, uh, there. Uh, I want to thank you and Giovanna again for coming and uh, helping us sort our problems here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. And um, I, I don't speak any Hebrew. Absolutely not. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. But I would like to uh, thank the organizers and the Rothschild uh, Foundation for the invitation. Um, I've been here for two days. Uh, thank you for a wonderful tour of Jerusalem with the, uh, my colleagues over there and, and also for the, the, the great hospitality. Yesterday we traveled around uh, Amat Hanidev and uh, it was fantastic. And last night I had a game drive and we saw four of the of uh, the mammal species, three of which are in trouble um, with this communities in this room here. So it was really interesting to see the different species that you are in contestation with. And, and if I'm reading the mood right, I think the temperature just went up a little bit. <laughs> yeah? So it's, it's difficult in a foreign language, but you can, the language of conflict cuts across all. <laughs> So, um, you're right, I started off, my research started off very much with uh, pure. So I was interested in animals for the sake of animals. But during the sixth extinction and the Anthropocene, it's very difficult to do pure research when you're watching entire systems collapse around you. So we've shifted our research to a much more applied um, nature. So that's what the Institute for Communities and Wildlife does. These are two species in Cape Town the uh, Chakma baboon and Giovanni, I'm going to tell you that a boar is nothing, <laughs> nothing compared to a baboon. You take a jackal, you take a boar, you put the best and the worst of both of them and you're still halfway only to a baboon. Imagine four hands, a dog's face, a primate brain. You put that together and I think if you can stop this animal from coming into conflict with people, you should be able to stop all the others. <laughs> now, in Cape Town, we also have uh, great white sharks. So we're a global aggregation site for white sharks. And we don't try and herd them. <laughs> we just, we have a completely different system, which I'll, I'll show you. I'll start off by just reminding you that, um, sorry, I'll, I'll just come back to that, yes. So this is uh, what we have here in, in, in Cape Town, and you don't really want to be surfing when uh, these guys are in the water. So we have to remember something that's missing from this talk, from this conference really, is the fact that we are no longer on the menu. And when we are on the menu, it changes everything completely. In, in Africa, lions eat people. In Tanzania, 100 people have died in the last 10 years, eaten by lions. We have to remember that's real conflict. Sorry to everyone here, <laughs> but this is the real stuff. We don't like to be on the menu. We really don't like it. And so we have a very unnatural fear of wildlife. And in Cape Town, we've come up with a novel solution. We have people on the mountain. We're very lucky. We have a mountain right next to a sea. They sit on the mountain, they watch for the sharks coming in, and we get out the water. So we give way to wildlife. When the apex predator comes past, we get out the water. It's as simple as that. And the apex predator goes past, it's not looking for people. Every now and again he makes a mistake, 
tastes a little bit, a leg falls off, and that's called an attack. Okay, it's not. They don't really see us as food, and so if we just get out of the way, then the apex predator can go past. Unfortunately, in terrestrial systems, it's much more complicated because, and this is what a lot of we're discussing today, we broke the ecosystem a long time ago. So your leopards? Did you have lion in Israel? Yes. Yeah, okay, you see. So when you break, so what you've done is, is and we did this too, we, we broke the system very early, and now we are playing, paying the consequences for the broken system. And, and this is something which comes up again and again. We have to manage. That means that we now have to do the management, which makes it incredibly difficult, which is why I'm going to go back to this slide. And this here is really why the Institute for Communities and Wildlife was born. We were tired of just trying to work here with uh, biology. So we were trying to understand wildlife and why they were getting into trouble with people. And we realized that we would never get the solution until we started to become interdisciplinary. So I, I was very pleased to hear that there are now social scientists and social science thinking that's coming into the wildlife management in, in Israel. That's fantastic. Um, it's really important. So our institute seeks to include sociology to understand society. Uh, my job has always been to understand the wildlife. And of course, we, we have to bring in the economists, the historians. The historians are so important because everything we do is a baseline, a new baseline, a false baseline. We don't know what was originally here. So we're constantly trying to manage towards something which we've made in our heads because we don't really know what the actual baseline is. And it's a really important point to remember that. Whenever you're striving for a particular goal, what is your assumed baseline and, and where are you going? And, and that'll be a lot of what I'll discuss today. <laughs> Philosophy, of course, that's fundamental to all of this. Ethics, politics, never underestimate it, particularly not in Israel. <laughs> and of course, the arts. Um, the arts are, or in South Africa, Two very complicated countries. So, yeah, so this is what we're doing. We're trying to bring all of this together to address the very, as we've, we've heard from everyone, the growing sense of conservation conflicts. They really are a growing, a growing phenomenon worldwide. And we need to remember, and it seems this is what your workshop is about, and this is what we've done. We have government, we have professional organizations, government brings law, policy, funding. And then we have these professional organizations. So these are my South African ones. But um, you know, these are the red meat producers. So there's agricultural people in here. There's wildlife people. And then the non-governmental non organizations are becoming more and more important, especially for, for our, us researchers. Because if we form partnerships with them, they're much better at getting money than we are. Because they hire people whose job is to get money, whereas we try and do it after hours, at the end of our day's work, we then try and go and find some money. So these partnerships together, this is essential. This whole slide here, I think, in order to address conservation conflict. And most of the mitigations and solutions lie here. We like to think as biologists and sociologists that we can come with solutions. And I understand that, but we are not managers. We are not wildlife managers. That job falls to someone else. So our job is to try and shape the policy of the government through engagement. And I guess this workshop uh, tomorrow and this, this symposium is really trying to bring enough people together to get onto the same page, to start finding the same language with a view to a really good argument uh, tomorrow. So just to go back to the terrestrial scenario, this is unfortunately what, look, what land looks like when it's fertile and it has water. So this is Holland. Hugo? Yeah? Holland and what you do best? Flowers. Okay, now it's a very strange thing to take good land and to use it for growing flowers. And we give flowers for everything. Flowers for love, flowers for sorry, flowers for death, flowers for birth. Flowers are ubiquitous. And yet they come at a huge biodiversity cost. I mean, you'll know how much biodiversity you don't have. In, in, in Holland right now. Um, it's, it's, it's devastating. And this is really what we have. Um, where the land is flat and productive, you've lost your biodiversity. 
and, and, and we, we use this in South Africa, all of this land over here, all of this brown here. Anyone know what that is? That's wheat. Yeah, that's where we grow our refined carbohydrates. So everything that's not uh, in brown there is a mountain. So in South Africa, we have real mountains. Sorry, Asaf. And our mountains are so steep and so large that we can't build or farm on them. It's very interesting for me to see here on your smaller mountains, you, <laughs> you, you build on top. Yeah, <laughs> hills. You, you build on top of them, uh, which is very unusual for us because the cost of building on a mountain is much higher. But you certainly can't do agriculture um, of, the, of this sort of commercial type up there. And of course, uh, wine. So here's a very good photograph to show you how all the low-lying land has gone to grapes. And then the only wildlife we're going to have really is whatever can survive on the mountains. Because everything else has been, has been converted. And this is where I live, Cape Town. So all of the low-lying land has been taken for urbanization, for people, for me, for my house. So my house, my food, everything about my life has come at a huge cost to biodiversity. And therefore, I'm part of the problem and hopefully part of the solution too. So in Cape Town, we can look at the history. We can see the green, the light green is good land. That's the optimal land. It's below 250 meters because very few animals want to live higher. This is what Cape Town was like uh, 400 years ago. And we've eaten away at all the good land. And now we have these little pockets left, except for this nice big piece at the bottom here, which no one could farm and no one could build in, really. You can live there, but the wind blows. So even the house will lean after a while. It's, it's a very, very difficult place to live. So what we find, land that we can't build or farm becomes a nature reserve. And then we have these many small patches of reserve which are really quite ineffective at conserving biodiversity. So we find a very strong positive correlation with the patch of the land and the species richness on it. So the smaller the patch, the less we find. So most of our wildlife is sitting at the bottom here, but all these patches here have wildlife and you can think of them as conflict spots because as soon as you have wildlife and you have people, you have great difficulty. Now, we broke this terrestrial system in 1902. The last leopard was killed in the, in the Cape Peninsula and it was killed because it was eating goats. So the usual story, we got rid of the predators that threatened us or threatened the things we like to eat. And so the, the leopards have gone, and leopards are very important. Leopards and lions eat a lot of baboons. They create a landscape of fear. They keep the baboons hiding up on the mountain sides. And so once we got rid of that, the pressure was released for these, not only the baboons, but many. And so what we have to remember is that broken ecosystems need constant adaptive management. And that's what many of you will spend your careers doing. And we have the same species like you do, the mesos. This is the, the rise of the meso. Yeah, this is the period of the medium-sized small mammal. This is their great time. We have caracal, lots and lots of caracal in Cape Town. And of course, we have uh, Cape Clawless otter too. So we've got PhD studies on all of these, but I'm, I'm not going to, to be discussing them today. In Europe, you've got your badges. Um, and in Israel, and your fox seems to be a particularly um, pertinent. I, I, I don't have a picture of Giovanni's boars here, but there you go. We, we had a talk from her today. And, and these stories are getting into our children's lives. Yeah? We have children's stories now about how fantastic Mr. Fox is. And this is a lethal story. This is about farmers trying to kill and really failing. And we keep hearing the story yeah? that the more you cull the more your problems become. And this is a story that we've encountered in South Africa too. It's a very difficult story for farmers. We called it a paradox in the, in the beginning, but it's so pervasive now that the evidence just seems overwhelming, is that just killing is going to cause you more trouble down the line. And, and of course, this is, this is the other, this is the uh, rapid urban urbanization. Our children are seeing these films. Um, it's, it's becoming part of our folklore, the conflict is just becoming part of what we teach our children through animated films. And here's the Chakma baboon. And this, this really, this slide summarizes the situation. The baboon is stuck between a rock, Table Mountain, and a hard place. 
which is the suburban areas. <coughs> if they go down into these areas here, there's a lot of rewards, but there's a lot of costs too. And I, this is where I'm going to convince you that there's nothing more challenging than a baboon. First of all, opposable thumbs. Yeah? Brilliant. Imagine having that on your feet too. Yeah? So you can, if you find a peanut butter jar, you can get the lid off. Yeah? That's just a major, a major advantage. You can climb up. This is the fourth floor. Now these baboons are coming out. They spent the night inside. Okay, so this is the South African Navy. We've come down a lot. Yeah, so one guy left his window out. He was out for the night and the baboons went onto the building in. They slept inside there. It was a big mess uh, the next day. And they even took his bedding out. And this is what the kitchen looked like. It was, they opened the door. They, when there's one baboon in your house, it's fine. They'll go to the fridge and they'll take the egg. Like, yeah, then the next egg, one, everything's nice and tidy. 40? <laughs> Competition, pasta, milk, everything. It's, it's, it's a mess. And then, of course, we are a, are a mess. We humans are very messy. So the baboons find it terribly easy to get food, or they used to, because we've now improved. This is now an old photograph. And we've had to work out ways of stopping them from getting access to our waste. They're a real challenge in agricultural areas. They take <coughs> tractors all the time. No, they don't. They, they, they just like to play on anything. But this is real. This is what happens in our main tourist area. I'm just warning any of you, if you go to Cape Town and you drive to Cape Point, it's beautiful. But the baboons open car doors and they get in while you're in your car. Okay, I've seen a male baboon get into a car with five men. The, the car wiggled and then all the doors, boom, open and five men ran. Yeah? And they should run because look at the mouth. The thing about the baboon is actually it is a very scary animal. It's, the teeth are longer than a lion. The, the, it's a, a bad story for the lion. These canines are exceptionally long and exceptionally sharp. So the lower tooth here is a, is a natural grinding surface. And it makes the, the rear end of the, of the tooth like a blade. So when they encounter a, a person in the hiking with their backpack in the mountain, the baboon comes up. He's learned that there's food in the backpack, shows his teeth. Drop the backpack, <laughs> run, and the baboon, they're brilliant. You know, they, they take the, the cleat, they push the cleat, they pull the string out, they open it, they do the clickety click, they, they, everything. <laughs> can the ball, Giovanni, can the ball? <laughs> this, unfortunately, if your dog decides to defend uh, your house against the baboon, there's a serious welfare issue for dogs, and it's a really, it's a really important issue. And, and I'm, I'm showing you all this because I'm showing you the level of the conflict. It's not nice to come home and you've lost all your food or your dog looks like this. This is just two canine, two, two canine slashes. And un, unfortunately, uh, the baboons have learned to eat sheep. During the drought, they became very good at eating the sheep, and in our arid central areas, it was usually a problem only for jackal but, and a caracal, but the baboon has now taken first position on many farms. And unfortunately, they're not good at killing. So their method is to just rip. And this is a terrible way for a farmer to find the animal which he loves so much and which he needs for his livelihood. So the hatred amongst the farmer, this is a difficult photograph, but it needs to be there because it's real. This is what the farmer does. He gets in or he does it himself, and there's a lot of shooting, and there's a lot of retributive killing. Now I'm gonna, this is in the rural area, and as, as was mentioned earlier on today, people living in the city are forgetting about how difficult it is to be a farmer. So they, the farmers in South Africa always say, don't criticize me with a mouthful of food. Because that for them is a great contradiction. They've got to grow the food, but you in the city, you just get it on a shelf. So meat isn't with four legs, it's in cellophane. We've lost the connection. So 
So in South Africa, uh, the farmers are in real trouble. Um, this is historical data, 94, 2004, 2014. And, and what you see here is this is, each one of these is a farm. And this is our main sheep growing area. And through time, we asked them when they first saw jackals and when they first became a problem for them, when they first saw caracal and they became a problem, and the same for baboon. And the, the story is the same for each one of these. Um, the problem is getting worse. In South Africa, there are very interesting socio-political economic reasons for that, and I can discuss that, but it's beyond the scope of this talk. But essentially, what I learned today, what I'm hearing, it's getting worse for the farmers here too. So a global challenge, which needs solutions. Now, we decided in Cape Town with the authorities, this was the goal, and I'm sure it's your goal too. I'm sure that none of you want to see the extinction of everything, so we're looking for sustainable population, which means we're not wanting to drive anything to complete extinction, maybe if it was an exotic species. We're trying to improve the welfare all the time. Okay? If, even if you hate the animal doing damage, you probably, I would hope, would not want to see it suffering unnecessarily. If it was going to die, you would like it to die as quickly and painlessly as possible. And you're always trying to improve the conservation status of your wildlife. And of course, the last thing is reduce conflict. These are the things that we typically aspire. So if there's a sentence to capture, this captures what I think a lot of what we're trying to do in Cape Town. But when it comes to managing, these are the difficult questions. And this is courtesy of Avi. We were chatting last night, and he said, this is, what we're, this is the point that we're at last night. So this slide, Avi, is as a result of that conversation with you. And I'll, I'll show you how I've tried to think through how we think about these challenges. So your first question, I guess, in your workshop is, who's responsible? Wh who's responsible for? And it seems to vary, the urban, the agricultural, and the natural. I say you have to get them all together. So well done for getting them all together. What are the goals? You have to be very clear about what your goals are. I've just given you our goal. Sustainable, improved welfare, um, improved conservation status, and reduce conflict. Who measures the management? So do you measure yourselves? Is there a conflict of interest with you measuring your own success? So we had this problem in Cape Town, and we've had to outsource a lot of our research to foreign universities to show neutrality and, and to give strength to the, to the outcomes because people, scientists, have vested interests and wildlife managers have vested interests. We all have vested interests. So we have to be very honest about um, who's going to do the critical thing of assessing whether something's working or not. How is it, ma how is it uh, managed? And I'll give you an example about how we manage our, our, our how we measure our, our management, which management interventions are successful, and I'll give you some examples of our best. I can't do all of them because we've tried everything. So who's responsible for baboons? This is a typical map. These are boundaries of properties, and the different colors refer to the different uh, land uses, the different ownership. So yellow is the city of Cape Town, so it's urban. Uh, green is uh, agricultural. Blue is uh, navy. South African Navy, and, and red is uh, recreation. So if you dis if onto this map, if you throw where the baboons are, the GPS points, everyone's land. They don't care. Which means that in order for this to become a solution, you need to get all of those people together because no one of them can solve the problem. So I'm going to start with where we failed. What we started off with when we were, I don't know where, I'm not going to say you're here at all. I'm, I don't know where you are in the, in the overall story. This is where we were back in 2000 to 2008. We failed because we identified, okay, so we have a species. So let's take, just say you have your, your boar, you have a boar challenge in this particular region. You get everyone together in a room who you think can help you solve your, your boar challenge. That's what we did. We called it the baboon management team. Just take the baboon each time and put your own species in there. It was very inclusive. Anyone could come, pretty much, in the original days. It was very reactive. They only responded to a, a crisis. And it was paralyzed in terms of making decisions about good management plans. And the reason for that is there were too many stakeholders in the room together trying to come up with protocols and management plans. 
So we had animal rights activists arguing with conservationists about effectively what are different belief systems. You will never solve, that, that was a, a, an argument for forever. It's an eternal argument about who's right or wrong about. So what they had to do is they had to realize that this had to be, this had to be split into different forums. You have that discussion in that forum, you have this discussion in this forum, but when it comes to actually managing, making tough management decisions, we demanded that the authorities stood up and took responsibility for the problem, for understanding it and for solving it, with consultation. And I'm outside now that you'll see that I get pushed outside of this, but that's fine. Researchers can be consulted. Rights activists can be consulted. But it's whether you want them in that original engine room of making your decisions, because we found that there was paralysis. So for eight years, baboons suffered as a result of this paralysis. As we also couldn't attract funding. The project just had so much controversy, no politician wanted to put money into it. Management, the people who were actually managing the wildlife were unprofessional, they weren't trained necessarily, they were often people who were volunteering. I heard the word volunteer many times today. You don't want volunteers. It sounds fantastic, it's too complicated. You need dedication. You need to be paid to do your job. And you need to learn on your job. We had strange things like walking tours and film crews, and, and that had to go immediately, okay? You can't have people making money out of conflict. So taking photographs and making movies about boars raiding gardens and what have you. So this is the bad, this is how bad we were. And I don't know where you are. 30% of the time, the baboons were in town. 53% of all the deaths were as a result of a retaliation. So after a, an incident of raiding, the animal was killed. Now, it's not killed properly then. It's killed with a, a pellet gun, an air gun, or it's killed with poison. It's a, it's a bad death. So this is not what, we, what we're looking for. Population numbers and trends, we didn't know how many. And there were very high levels of habituation, very much like you're telling me about your boars and your jackals. Now, they have, they have no fear of people. The video we saw of them in the park, that's what we had in, in Cape Town. And, and worst of all, we didn't have good data to inform management. So we really were in a bad state. And this is the sort of relationships that were happening between baboons and this is a, this is a tour. Now you're going to try and stop this animal from coming into an urban area, but look, he's not scared of people anymore. So we decided, together with the, with the authorities, to do a, a, a research program. We went to the authorities, we said, what, what data do you need? They said, we need the following data. We want to know how many baboons, how does the density vary with habitat, what are they eating, is there enough natural food? Do they have to come to town? Do they have to eat in the farming area? Is there enough food? Are they genetically or behaviorally unique? Because we, there was the option of translocation at that stage, which, as everyone will tell you, you don't translocate pests. You translocate rare, special species that you're trying to conserve. And have they acquired human pathogens? Because this turned out to be one of the most important factors for changing the way they were managed. Once we realized that there was risk, then people accepted that we should be neighbors, but we shouldn't share space. So uh, the, 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 this is what we do with research. We go out and we put collars on. We try and understand how the animals are using the space. We look at the habitat. We see how altitude affects them. We look at slope. We look at water. We put it all together into a big model. And we ask what influences their feeding, their sleeping site, and how they use their water. And here's the bad news. <laughs> So, in yellow, in yellow is natural land. So everything inside the yellow polygon is natural conservation land. All the dots, the red dots, the black dots, and the blue dots are GPS collars of three different family groups, about 180 baboons. The brown is a plantation, so it's a commercial pine plantation, sorry, the, uh, the dark green, yeah. And this here is vineyards. Now you put a baboon together with a vineyard, you have a very, very cross farmer. Very, drunk. very drunk baboon, very cross farmer. <laughs> and then of course, everything outside of that, this is all urban. Okay, so the baboons are going into the urban areas and the results of our model show that baboons, like boar, 
and like Jackal, you give them a choice, they would prefer human modified landscapes. Why? More food. That's really, it's a simple, and I'll show you, I'll finish my talk with more food. Sorry, more money. Uh, uh, funny, yeah, fun, great, it's fantastic. Yeah, you get to ride on the telephone wires and lie in the satellite dish and yeah, so it's, it's a great life, and, but mostly it's, it's food. And remember, the predators have gone from the system. It's like going to the zoo for this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's a, real, it's a real problem. And then yeah. if we look at the numbers, this will be very interesting for you. So we count. We, we know exactly how many animals we've got because we know every animal. We have 600. We know every one. Yeah, you learn every identity. So we have a density. We don't have to worry about doing density estimates. We just count. And here's very interesting for you. In the park, the numbers came down in a drought and they're very stable. So when they eat natural, food only. So we have a Mediterranean system. They're not very productive systems. You know what this vegetation is like. Would you like to eat this, <coughs> this heathland? It's full of tannins and secondary compounds. Oh, it's tough. <laughs> Look here. If they go into urban areas, then it goes up, but there's a lot of conflict, so there's people killing them, so the numbers are fairly stable too. But look what happens when they hit the agricultural area. That's just the best. 8% growth is unprecedented. We know the best wild populations are doing 4%. So in this one slide, you get to see how an animal moving across different landscapes gets to change its numbers. We, we looked at the genetics for the translocation, um, even though they've been isolated for about 150 years. Here on the, here's the peninsula. They share, G, they share uh, mitochondrial DNA with these neighboring populations, so we could move them, but when we tested them for disease, we were very upset to find that baboons had acquired two human viruses, three, two herpes viruses and, and hepatitis A. So this is a very bad sign. This means that sharing a lot of time with people has come at a great cost to the baboons. The baboons now have it. If you take them and you move them off the peninsula, you're going to incur a cost on wild baboons. So that's not a good idea. It's also not a good idea for people to touch the urine, the feces, or the saliva of a baboon. And if you're a pregnant woman and you get hepatitis A, there's serious consequences for the fetus. Now, once this publish, paper was published, there was an immediate reaction from the city. Because now the city is responsible for the health of the citizens. And now they know from the scientists that there's a real risk. Now they have to think about how they're going to keep them separate. We also looked at the uh, endoparasites. This particular worm, it's a uh, um, trichurus, trichurus, the whipworm. Do you, you have trichurus in Israel? Children get it a lot from sand, but you probably treat your children. In Africa, we're not so good at treating our children, so it's quite common for them to get an itchy bum. Yeah, that's how you know you get trichurus. Yeah, okay. So the baboons have got a human trichurus. And the humans in South Africa have got a baboon. So we've swapped, we've swapped our worms, which is remarkable. When we did the genetics of the worms, so all, all together, this just suggests, if you look at the profile, don't spend time. When wildlife spends time with people, it might feel lovely. And let me confess, I wanted to be Mowgli. Do you know Mowgli yeah. from the Jungle Book? That was my dream, to be living with animals and sharing space. But I realized that that's just a romantic, selfish. You understand you can do it now. I can do it. <laughs> because the problem, is, the problem is it comes at such a cost to the animals because we are so dangerous, not only from a viral point of view, but from a worm point of view and from a behavioral point of view. Okay, this is an obvious thing for you guys to do with your bores. A simple modification of your wheelie bins, these bins with wheels. Uh, this, we have to do this. This we have to do because baboons have fingers. So you could clip your, your bins like this. They still go into the machine and it can still operate and the bore can turn the bin upside down a hundred times and the food won't come out. That's a very simple modification to the bin. Um, in the national parks, we need this for the baboon. The baboon tends to climb on top of the bin and do this. So if you put the mechanism on top, he, he pulls against his weight and then he's stuck. These, we, we are clever. Yeah, we, we, we are. We have no excuse, none, for having bins that animals can get into. That's just lazy yeah, and not clever. But we are clever. So 
So in Cape Town, the next step was to, um, to stop the baboons from getting access to the agricultural land and the urban land. Why not we introduce the locals? So we can't introduce the leopards because the leopards will take small dogs and cats before they will take baboons because baboons... So the residents, we've tried that, but the residents won't have it. But in other areas, rewilding is definitely a point. So we employ in South Africa, we have high unemployment, we have fairly cheap labor, it's going up all the time. So we employ field rangers, previously uh, disadvantaged people who are looking for employment, and their job is to stop the baboons from coming across the roads and into the urban area. Does it work? So this is the home range of uh, baboons. Red is when they have got no management. Green is when they've got management. That yellow line is the urban edge. You want them outside of the yellow line. So when you have men employed, they arrived at work and they pushed them over here and they spent almost all their time out of the urban edge <coughs> compared to before. If you look at the number of raids, the number of times they get into town and they take food from people, it, when the monitors are present, there's 28 raids on average compared to 78 raids when they're absent. So yes, you can push down the number of interventions if you've got people. But still, the baboons get through. This is a photograph to remind us that we were still not doing very well. Each one of those is a gun, a bullet. Yeah, so a shotgun. This was one of the males that we put down. One of the first males that was put down. 70 bullets in him. Okay, so the signature of conflict was still there. So we did what you're doing. Liat, we held an international workshop. We brought people from all around the world and we said, how do we do more than just herding the baboons and stopping them like this? Because every time we tried to do something more aggressive, the animal rights activists put up their hands and said, you can't do that, it's unfair to the animals. And we said, some of the animals are so bad, and we acknowledge that we failed them, they should be put down because they've gone too far. They, they come up and they grab you and they shake you to get food from you. And when they don't get it, they give you a little bite and then see if you drop something. So it was getting too far. So we, we, we were stuck. And every time we tried to do something, it went to the newspapers. And they're, they're much better in the newspapers than we are. We, we, we went with facts. They went with emotion. We lost every time. So we were stuck. So we had the workshop. We brought experts from around the world. There's Shirley Strum, the, the best uh, baboon researcher really in, in the world at the time. And things start to work. After this workshop, we got the agreement for the onset of aversive conditioning with support from the SPCA. Now that's our welfare, official welfare body in South Africa. They accepted our theory that if we could non-lethally keep the baboons out more, fewer would be killed. Simple. And that's got to be a good thing. So they said yes. They also, we, just, we started to develop these protocols, and I'll show you what these protocols look. So from 2009 to 2012, this is what we changed. Now we have the authorities, for the first time, agreed to own the problem and the solutions. They would consult with other stakeholders biannually. So they would get the opinion of all the other stakeholders and interested people, but they agreed that this was their problem and they must fix it. And that was very important because then the money started to flow. So they developed protocols, standard operating plans, management plans, everything that I think that you're about to do. And suddenly the politicians opened the, 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 their pockets. And the, the funding went from 150,000 rand to uh, 10 million. So that's 1 million US dollars. 1 million US dollars per year for managing this particular species within a city of 5 million people. So funding increased. Then this was very important, this, this management by professional and conservation companies. This is such an important point, I can't tell you. The number of times that we tried, we, we accepted who's going to manage the problem. Uh, it was this volunteer group and they were going to try this plan. No. Professional. Advertise, offer the big money with the tender, get professionals, or if you, if you have the resources to do it nationally, fantastic. Because then you get a coordinated plan and everyone acting similarly across the board. So that was a, a huge thing. We stopped all forms of making money from wildlife like that. And 
the baboons immediately 10% of the time, so we're down from 30%. The deaths, 30% of retaliatory killing, still high, and the population was showing signs of increasing. So this is what our management structure looks like. And, the, and, and this is what you're going to have to work out for your, your different species, or maybe you'll do it by, by each town or each agricultural district, or you'll have to decide. But we have a baboon technical team. We've got the national. This is the South African national parks, the provincial, and the city. They have to sit together. A representative who has decision-making ability has to come to the meeting every month, once a month. They invite... Well, this is, they then contract a service provider. So this is Human Wildlife Solutions. They're a professional company, happen to be behavioral ecologists, so they're very, they, they know their animals. They invite researchers um, to meetings and civilian representatives. So people who have an opinion about the, the level of difficulty about living with boars or living with jackals or farmers. So this is the, this is the matrix that's, that makes up the decision-making group. But the decisions still lie completely with the baboon technical team. Even if I don't like it, and I argue, it's their responsibility. So this was the first big change, aversive conditioning. This is a paintball gun. And many people objected to this, a gun on a wild animal. But the idea was simple. If the baboons come towards the town, the urban edge, and they see the people standing there, and they know the people have the ability to affect an action at a distance. It means that the ranges were much more effective. If you shoot, you can only shoot the baboon when it's decided to run at you and come into town. It has complete freedom of choice to stay on that side in the natural land. So the baboon has to make the choice to come towards you with an action. And so the paintball guns have worked fantastically well. Um, this, this troop here, this is the GPS points. The troop was raiding this area here. The first day the guys came out, they shot them on the edge here, and the baboon spent the rest of the month living in this area here. Was Very... It pepper or... No, just a paint. Just a paint? Just a paintball, yeah. Biodegradable paint, so it disappears in the environment. This was another one. This was a very interesting experiment on uh, noise aversion. Now, we hear that uh, aversive conditioning doesn't really work that well, but this was using a bear banger, something that was developed in America. If a grizzly bear comes for you, you take out a, it looks like a pen, and you press it like this, and it makes a bang, and the grizzly bear sees you, and there's a bang, and then it shoots, and there's a second bang, bah, behind the bear. And that's very good for deterring the bear. So what we did with the baboons is that we, men hid. The baboons couldn't see them. They were coming towards town, and they would let off one of these bear bangers. They didn't know who it was doing it. They couldn't see. They looked around, gone. Six months before the first baboon came back. So this was the home range. This was the home range of the, of the baboons over here, the white line. This orange line here was the, was the uh, city border, and that there was the area where we wanted to get them south of. And if I show you, that's before and that's after. So the, con the home range contracted dramatically before and after this intervention. And this lasted for six years. It's still going. Now, we call it these days a virtual fence. The idea is the animals don't see what's doing it. The anxiety of not knowing what made the noise. And we vary the noise. Sometimes it's a lion roaring. Sometimes it's a, it's a tape-recorded sound of a buffalo calf being killed by hyenas. All these strange noises. And the baboons and all the other wildlife really don't like it. It builds great anxiety and they avoid the area. It's remarkably successful. I heard a lot of stories about uh, fences today. This is the, uh, one of the, the best success stories in the Cape Peninsula. Everyone said you can't stop a baboon from, with a fence because they can climb over. Okay. So we heard today as well from Giovanni that the pigs start to scream as they're coming. Well, the baboons, they take the small one and they put it on the fence and if the fe then they go, it's, uh, it's, it's on. <laughs> so then they, then they leave the, the fence alone. So, so that was a real problem, but what happens there is you can see it's electrified. It's got electric fencing there, so the baboons have to climb and they get shocked and they get pushed off. This is uh, solar powered fencing. It's, it's uh, fairly expensive and I'll show you how well it worked. This is a troop. This is the GPS points. This is a, a very uh, wealthy area. 
Okay, they had uh, lots of horses, lots of vegetable gardens, and they didn't want to baboon-proof their lives. They didn't want to change their lives to live next to a wild animal. So they asked for the fence, and the fence was going to go there. You see, it's not a complete fence. So I know connectivity is very important. It's a strategic fence. It's a section of fencing in a high conflict zone. And the fence was 100% successful again. So this is the, the nice thing about this is that the baboons can go right next to the edge and forage. But they don't get in there. And these people, we, we monitored the property prices before and after and we compared it to a control suburb. Their property prices went up by 28% more than the control suburb. Just by having a fence now, they were guaranteed they could live their lives without conflict with wildlife. Now here's the most difficult part. Once you've done all of these interventions, so now you have effectively, this, this was the last piece of the puzzle. You've got bear bangers, noise aversion, You've got field ranges with aversive conditioning. You've got an electric fence. 90% of the budget, 95% of the budget is non-lethal. What do you do when an animal gets over all of that? All of that money? We're investing a million US dollars. What do you do when an animal gets over that? And what do you do when that animal gets over it and attacks a child? I know. I didn't want you to read it. I wanted to ask you the question. And we, this is where we made the difficult decision. Is that we accepted that there had to be a component of lethal measurement. That if you're only non-lethal, you get to the maximum level of your deterrent. There's nothing more in your legislation that will allow you to do something. What's your next step? And so we had to devise a lethal protocol. But I think we're the only place in, uh, not, no, we won't be the only ones in the world, but one, one of the few in the world where we manage at the level of the individual. So this is Fred. Yeah, Fred. He was uh, SW01. And Fred was a baboon that had acquired an incredible ability to, he would go into a building with people, he would go into a car with people, he would break a door or a window to get into a house he would attack people directly for food. So this is his, this is his um, criminal charge sheet, <laughs> if you like. And every one of these incidents comes with an affidavit from a resident that was attacked. So they have to go and report it to the police. This is to stop people from making stories. On the, so on the left-hand side, it's also the animal's health, whether it's in... Because very often you find that when animals are in poor health, they will do this. So you want to know if it's sick, um, what its teeth are like, and then you want to know how often. How often are they doing this, this, uh, this bad behavior? And then on the, on the other side, just like a good court, it's <laughs> mitigation. What are the arguments in mitigation of this animal? Have you worked hard enough in order to justify a lethal removal? This forces the authorities to improve the landscape that's resulting in raiding. So if it's an alpha male, then we don't want to take it away so easily. So there's a one mitigation factor because he's the, he's the boss. Is the, have the municipality, the city, are they managing their waste properly? Is the private people managing their waste? Has there been a recent extensive fire to take all the natural food away? Is there been an extreme drought to drive the behavior? So what you do is you, you factor in all the naughty behavior, all the mitigation factors, and the green ones and the red ones are the worst of each, or the best and the worst. So if you've made no attempt, yeah, monitor team, if you've made no attempt to put people on that trip to drive them out of town, you can't easily get rid of those baboons by killing them. Because it means you haven't tried or exhausted your non-lethal options first. And this is because we know that lethal only management is causing more trouble then it's solving. But you still need to be able to have the ability to take a lethal decision. So you, you add them up, you look at the, the two, you, make, you do some intervention plans that are going to get your plan, and then you, you catch Fred and you give him a lethal injection. And then you drive with 20 activists behind your vehicle when you're going to dispose of the body with cameras, with movie cameras, and you get hate mail 
and the newspapers are full of stories about how disgusting you are because you engaged in lethal management, and it's an extremely difficult space to work in. So when you make the decision to, to include lethal, you have to be ready for contra con contradiction. You also need to be ready for the fact that if you haven't exhausted your non-lethal options, then you have right to criticism. Now, 70 baboons have been killed this way. And unfortunately, um, it's, it's still causing a lot of trouble in Cape Town. But let me show you the most important uh, data here. The blue here is retributive killing. That's when someone in the public decides to kill an animal because they've had enough and they kill it badly. And so you see with time, this is when the protocol was first introduced, the green here, the blue has been declining. The green is lethal management, so protocol deaths. You made a decision to kill an animal. And you can see there was an initial peak because you had to get rid of, rid of the worst raiders, and now it too is coming down. So the welfare, we would argue that because the blue is coming down, the number of times that a baboon gets killed by an illegal means, that's a good thing. It's coming right down. So that we think that the welfare has been improved. I've, I showed you already the, uh, the sustainability of the population. So to conclude then, I'd just like to have this last slide about what I think has really worked. Yes? Is it 70 baboons out of 600? Yes, uh, over the entire period. This was just, in the last couple of years, there's been more. 15%, 12% of the population. Yes. Not yeah, not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so, so here we go. This is the latest period. This has stayed the same. Um, this is a really, so the management structure is in place. Um, management, research and policy are all aligned. So every year, managers meet with the scientists and they tell them what their next research is that they want to have done. That's fantastic. So the, the managers use the, the scientists at the universities as a resource. And then we are aligned with that. And it's aligned with the policy decisions that we have at the level of the city. Funding continues to increase, and that the, the most important part there was to open the tender, to make it a competitive process to compete for a large amount of money to do the management. So when you spoke about the, um, the uh, removal of the carcasses, I mean, I don't know who was paying for that, but that would be a classic example of a contractor competing for a tender to do that job across the Israel, you know, or, or in each region or what have you, because it's such an important clarity on roles of the various authorities and so what we've seen is that as people know what their, their, their responsibilities are, so they've got better public relations, um, daily management by behavioral ecologists, which is a real... So what we have here is less than 2%, less than 2% of the total time we have wildlife now in the urban areas. So we feel like we've solved the problem. Only We still have some retaliatory deaths, but it's um, 14% and the population is stable. So I think we're one of the few places in the world that has, has uh, suffered badly, found a solution by having an international workshop like this, uh, largely non-lethal management, which is by and large accepted by most people, with a small component of lethal, because if you don't do that lethal, then you really do, and this is really important, and I think it'll lead straight on to Asaf's next talk, you will make people who actually don't mind wildlife or even like them, start to hate them. So we've done social surveys through this and we find that if there's no action and a baboon keeps raiding and raiding and causing damage, people who used to like and tolerate wildlife start to hate wildlife and not have tolerance. And then you really have failed. And it's only when we sort all of this out, ultimately, can we start thinking of other ways, maybe commercializing and having walking tours with baboons again as part of a sustainable economic model? Where does the money come from? This is the first question I usually get. Everyone in Cape Town pays rates. So for my house, I pay a tax to the government for water, electricity, sewage. Tiny piece goes to wildlife. Yeah, and we take it from the same budget. It is three cents or something per individual, no one even notices it, no one complains, that gives you your 15 million rand or 1 million US dollars a year to manage your urban space so that you can have 90% non-lethal with a little bit of lethal. Thank you.
question. Yes. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, two small questions. The first one is, uh, how did you decide what is the aim of the population size of the baboons that you want to get to? Because as you've shown, some of it has risen. And the other one is, you've shown mainly how to pre prevent them from coming into the city. What about the farms, the local farms? How do they prevent the baboons from uh, Okay, so the first question is, is really a carrying capacity or what populations we go for? And the answer is we don't really know. So uh, what we did is we studied the baboons in the only area where they can only eat natural food. And there we got a density of two baboons per square kilometer. So we said if you took that and you put it over the whole peninsula, then we could have a maximum population of 450. But if they get access to agricultural and urban, then the numbers go up and we'll end up at 650. So we have a, if we can keep them out all the time, we expect 450. If we can't, we're going to go as high as 650. So it's a bit of a moving target depending on how good we are. But the goal is, if they stay in natural land and they never get access to human-derived food, their population growth will self-regulate down. Now, we're not getting there with the agricultural, so we're going to have to do what they've done with the boar. We're considering contraception, but very reluctantly. Because the moment you get into the contraception with the primate, you're fundamentally changing the social structure. So it's a very difficult one. And your second question is... About the farms. Yeah, the farms. So the farms... So, uh, how many farmers are there here? Okay, how many of you have an orchard? Are you fruit farming or fruit? So Fruit animals. Fruit and animals. So for when it's a small... So when the farmers have a high-value crop, in a discrete physical place, the recommendation is always a baboon-proof fence. It keeps out everything. Yeah? And the, the farmer is paying for it. And the, the, yeah, the farmer pays for it. Now, the challenge with the farmer is to get him to do the 20 years calculation of the cost, mm -hmm. over 20 years of managing, you know, a little bit, a little bit, a bit of shooting, a bit of, yeah, that's, and uh, the trauma of, of not knowing when your next attack is going to happen is, is overwhelming. So we go to the fence first. If the farmer can't afford, because usually you find that the, 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 the economics show that over a 20-year period, which is how long the fence will last, with some maintenance, it's going to be much more economical to build the fence. It doesn't really work when you go to a huge wheat field. That gets more complicated. But the, you know, the returns for a baboon aren't very high in the wheat field, so they don't really worry there so much, I guess. for a So small, we go for fences. And I can show you... Um, yeah, so small as fences and larger than that as field ranges. Now, I guess we're lucky. We have fairly cheap labor. And that might be a really different situation. Yeah? But um, the farmers um, in the... So in South Africa, you can shoot two animal... A farmer can shoot two animals a day. No question. Just, that's just the way it is. It's not something we're proud of, but... It's the right of the farmer to protect himself. It's not something that the authorities do. So that's that. But that law is getting, it's, it's closing down a bit. But in the urban area, you're not allowed to use a gun. Uh, it's probably the same here. And therefore, the non-lethal option comes first. And, uh, the, and the farmers look at the, non, at the urban place and they, they say it's not fair. There's two rules here. So we advocate for vineyards, fencing every time, every single time. And for the jackal, in the, in the rural area, electric fencing as well. Works fantastically well. So fencing is our first prize. But we are mindful of the connectivity challenge. Okay, so the, the first question is how many people are working on the, in the institute or with the baboons? In the, with the baboons, about the baboons. Oh, are you managing them? Yes. 70. 70, 70 people employed full time, uh, 480 baboons managed. So it works out as a, it's a high percentage. Now, it's, it seems crazy, doesn't it? It's so much money. Now, don't forget the baboon, like the boar and the jackal, is a least concerned conservation status. But the signal here is that urban people are prepared to put money in. And you can do it. Are you, that urban pot will never... We saw the, the data this morning. The urban number's growing. 
The urban pot of money is big. It's tiny amount of money for each individual. And what it looks like, you have a real challenge here, is that if the urban area is feeding your wildlife a lot, and that, in my understanding from what I've seen here, um, where's Amir? Took me last night to see, yeah. That, that's in my head, seeing jackals eating cat food in an urban area is, is such a crazy concept for me because the jackal numbers are going to go up and then the jackal are going to go and hit the farmers harder as well. So the urban people are making a trouble for the rural people. And it's such a, you know, there's such easy things to fix right now. Yeah, it's a, so 70 people and, um, and that's the budget. What size of, of area, 70 people working maybe? Oh, it's the peninsula, it's, um, let me get this right, it's about 100, it's about 80,000 hectares. So it's, it's about 120 kilometers by about 40. So 120? About 80,000 hectares of total area that's actually managed uh, intensively, yeah. Kilometer. Yeah. Yes, well, they used to be. You see, now, as management covered the whole day, then we had our first nocturnal baboon. It's amazing how they're adjusting to this. So now we're getting our first raids at night time. The farmers, so the other thing that the farmers do, so they have uh, the guys who work in the field. They've all got paintball guns. When they see the baboons coming, they all drop the scissors and whatever they were doing, and they go to the defense and they push the baboons out. But now the baboons have learned that the labor finishes at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. <laughs> so it's a real problem, yeah. So we are changing the behavior. And now for the first time, we have a double shift. So we have, in summer, when it's such a long day, we have one shift for until lunchtime, and then the other ones take over until 8 o'clock. So now we cover the whole, the whole time. And that's where we need predators. So, and also you mentioned the 8% increase and in fact you, you thought that the political show might be a problem. So that you can sure. So, so we tried volunteers before the program got proper money. And a volunteer is good for a week maybe and then the first time it's raining really badly, they're all gone. And uh, we, it, was, it, was, it was very difficult. And of course, the baboon is a very fast, clever animal. It's the best 4x4 four by, four by far. I mean, they can cover any terrain. You have to be super fit. You've got to be super brave. And uh, the bad news is uh, baboons are very sexist. So when we tried female volunteers, a baboon um, sees a woman and runs straight at the woman. <laughs> So it goes through the line every time at the, and unless you're, and, and some women are braver than men, as we know, but uh, even when the baboons now made the assumption that because you're a woman he's going to run at you, it's very difficult to stand your ground because he's 40 kilograms with teeth and he's coming at you, and if you hesitate for one second, he's got you, and then he'll just push you down and run over you. So it's scary, there was, there was, and it was difficult, you know, it's 365 days a year. So the, the important thing, I think one of the most important things about the project is that you don't give up for one day. You, someone said it earlier on, when you're doing the wildlife management, you commit to it completely. This is it, for the next 100 years, you are going to be doing this. So you have to budget for it, and employ, and you go. This is what you do. If you do three months and you stop, it's fatal. In fact, you do more damage. And then on the population side, with the 8%, we, we're actually, um, I'm, I need to talk to you, we, we're exploring uh, Des Lauren for the females. I completely agree with you. We've got a, it's the female fertility we're, we're looking at. Um, so next year, we're going to have to, because we can't stop them from coming into the farm. The farmers aren't as committed to putting up a fence as we think they need to be. And so they're still getting in enough, and their growth's going up too high. So the density of baboons has now reached, instead of two, it's got to 15 baboons per square kilometer in the rural areas. 
And so we think contraception has to come in as, a, as our last resort to curbing that growth rate. There's one there. Never. You have to keep going at it time and again, time and again, and it's not going to disappear. Never. So the silver bullet is the worst analogy to ever have in human wildlife conflict. One stop shop to solve the problem. If, if you think you've got it, I'm sure you're wrong. Because animals will work away, you know, so you, you get them to stop coming here, they're going to go there, you know. So the most important thing is to commit, is to get the commitment to do this in perpetuity and see it as a job creating thing. It's, it's good employment, it's good for the wildlife, ultimately it's good for people to have a job and do what Israel does best, become world leaders in it, you know, by... <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, one more. I was thinking about the who monitors the managers. Ah. And you talked about it being uh, from outside of South Africa. Yes. And I was thinking that actually uh, all human life is full of uh, conflicts of interest. And we don't always have to bring in outsiders to monitor what we do. Isn't there? Can you do without that outside? Because who knows? Who thinks they know better? Yeah, you're, you're so right. So, so let me tell you what happened. Is that w the moment we were being consulted? Um, so we, we sit. Management consults us as scientists, and then we we they, people started seeing us as part of them, or they felt that the line was being blurred, that we were too close to the management. So when when uh, lethal management started, I got lots of hate mail, and I said to them, No, no, no I'm a scientist informing. It's their policy. So, so I was just an easy target, I think, because I'm at a university and we're a bit more vulnerable. So what we realized is when it came to um, did aversive conditioning work, we thought, okay, if we do it, they, they're going to say, we don't believe you. So we, I went to them and I said, how about this? We go to an outside university and we ask them to come in and evaluate it. Will you believe that? In writing, we will believe that. So we went to Swansea University in the United Kingdom. And they built, this is a really interesting thing for those of you who like technical things. They make these smart collars with accelerometers. So from the accelerometers, you get one second GPS. And you can reconstruct the entire activity budget of the animal. You know when they ate, you know when they slept, you know when they even groomed each other. You and they mated, you know everything. So if you're interested in your boars or your jackals and you want to get this behavior, go to these smart collars. But in the, at the same time, every one second, we put them on all the males in one of our troops, so the males are the main raiders, and look at the result. Their result is at the bottom here, 1.8% of time in urban areas. 1.8, so, so I mean that's, not, that's just ridiculously successful. Uh, we were surprised at how successful, so this is measuring the, the, the effectiveness of keeping the baboons out of the areas. The collar goes on, the collar can't lie about where it is, it's recording every one second. And then we went, to, we published this in a, in a good scientific journal, and the activists said, we believe you. And we are sorry that we called you lots of bad names for using aversive conditioning, because we now understand that fewer animals die a bad death as a result of you taking a, a much more aggressive stance to, to the wildlife. A follow-up? Yes, sorry. Do you, th you, you, you mentioned philosophy in the yes. first slide. Do you think there's a difference relating to primates as opposed to other types of animals? Yes, I've discovered two things. For every species, there's a love group. Uh, primates happens to be a particularly passionate mm -hmm. group. Uh, possibly because of the anthropomorphizing of the behaviors. Um, for me, I'm always amazed. Baboons, if you, um, I don't think, from what I've learned from my hosts, um, corporal punishment's not a big issue with parenting. Is it in Israel? You don't hit your children. Baboons are incredibly hard on their offspring. Biting, uh, hitting, it's, it's, it's really aggressive. And then on the sexual side, it's also, you know, so I'm not sure where the, 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 the parallel comes from with the, 
But w when, we go to, when we go to leopards, we have a group called the, the Landmark Foundation, and, and, and they, they, their lives are about saving leopards, but sometimes you can't because the leopards run out of teeth and it's killed 40 sheep. So there has to be a difficult decision. So on the philosoph philosophical side, I, I find that it doesn't matter where you go, you're going to bump into people who hate what you do. Um, how you manage that, I think, is a really interesting. I was very naive. I, I was very. I took the criticism very badly, and I didn't know how to react to it. But I had to just. It's it's like religion. You, it's I, there's no point arguing. It's your belief system. It's yours, and then it just matters who is the authority going to go with, you, or the other one, and that's, that's really. The politics. Yeah, that's the politics. Thank you, Thank you very Thank you. much.